Hello and welcome to episode four of Chatterbox. My name is Callum and I'm an associate artist at Playbox Theatre, the company behind Chatterbox. Now, I hope you've all had a lovely week. There's been a lot of talk and a lot of frustration this week about what the future of theatre should be and how the government should best support the live arts. It's one of the reasons that I'm so excited to talk to the Shadow Culture Secretary, Labour MP Tracy Bravin, next week, right here on Chatterbox. Public booking will open on Tuesday morning at 9am, so set your alarms and get booked in because it's going to be an incredibly exciting chat. The week after that, we've got an actor you may not have heard of yet. In 2019, BAFTA selected him as one of their breakthrough Brits, and he's about to star in a huge HBO sci-fi TV series directed by Hollywood legend Ridley Scott. So clear your diaries on the 17th of July and come and chat to Abu Bakr Salim. Seriously, he's going to be one to watch. And if you thought that was good, you just wait till I introduce today's guest. But first, you know the drill by now, Chatterboxers. We want you to get involved in these conversations too. So if you're one of the lucky young people with me now in the Zoom interview, get those questions coming in. If you hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen on a laptop or the top of your screen on a mobile, then you'll find a button you can click to send questions directly to me. Importantly, you'll be able to see the questions other people have asked, and you can vote for the ones you'd like to hear answered. Now, the more votes, the higher they appear in the inbox. And guess what? We're gonna try and get through as many as we can. Now, if you're watching live on Facebook, hello, and a shout out to Chatterbox superfan Pam, I know you'll be watching. Facebookers, though you can't message in questions, we still want to hear from you. So send us your reactions, your comments, your feedback to at Playbox Theatre, hashtag Chatterbox, on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. We don't mind which. Now, it's time to introduce my special guest. Laura Wade needs no introduction, but I'll do it anyway. Laura is an Olivier Award-winning playwright and screenwriter. She studied drama at Bristol University before becoming a part of the Royal Court Young Writers Programme in 2003. The National Theatre play, Home, I'm Darling, premiered at Theatre Cluid in 2018 before playing at the National Theatre where it received rave reviews and won the Olivier Award for Best New Comedy. In 2018, Laura adapted Jane Austen's unfinished novel, The Watsons, at Chichester Festival Theatre. It was due to transfer into the West End this year. Her sellout play, Posh, began life at the Royal Court and, yep, you guessed it, transferred into the West End. It was later adapted into the screenplay The Riot Club, starring Max Irons, Sam Claflin and Douglas Booth. Laura has written several plays for young people, including The Wild Swans, Twelve Machine and The Last Child, a trilogy of fairy tale reworkings for Playbox Theatre. She's won countless awards. She's had so many five star reviews that astronomers have started taking an interest. She's written for radio, theatre, film, television and even the Sydney Opera House. Let's take a look at the trailer for the West End transfer of the Watsons that was due to open in May this year. so thrilled to welcome our fourth guest to series two of Chatterbox, the remarkably talented writer, Laura Wade. Laura, thank you so much for joining me today. Hello, hi, thank you. How's lockdown been treating you? I'm not going to lie, I've not loved it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's like, fair enough. Um, you, you kind of imagine that the thing that all you need to do to a writer to get them to write something brilliant is lock them away mm. um and, and quite a lot of you know retreats and things are, are, are built around that idea but um I, actually I sort of need to be out in the world a bit more um so and I found this talking to other writers I know we've not really been finding it a particularly creative time um which which seems a bit contrary really but um I miss going to the theatre 
know, my well, be on, so. Yeah, well, of course, and we will talk about that. Um, but that sort of feeling uncreative actually leads us quite nicely into our first question, which comes from last week's guest, the star of sex education, Amy Lou Wood. She says, I have been writing and I'd like to ask Laura how she self-motivates on days when she's feeling like she's hitting a brick wall. Well, first of all, brilliant that she has been writing, given what I just mm. said. So, um, <laughs> I mean, I think that's part of the job. The essential job of, of being a writer is making yourself write. Mm. So it's, it's getting to your desk and then you can give yourself a little tick for getting to your desk and then it's trying to stop reading the entire internet and, um, and, and all of those things and, and, and getting started and getting started is very often the hardest thing. Um, I often find I just make myself write the rubbish version of the thing that I'm trying to write because the inner critic is 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 before you even get your pen onto the page you're saying that's rubbish that's that's or, or that's unoriginal or I, I, was, mm -hmm. I saw that before or that's basically this plot of star wars or you know <laughs> any, any other kind of things and um and actually i think thing number one you need to do is get words onto paper so either it's write the rubbish version of the scene and look at it later and work out what's wrong with it or I sometimes do things like writing a massive long list um, of um, so maybe it might be um, if so because if something's not working maybe it's because I don't know enough about a character for example so okay. making a massive long list of facts about that character or um, things I don't know about them or things I do know about them or um, you know a, a list of things that could happen in the scene that, that can be as bonkers as a spaceship lands and then you cross off all the all the ones that don't work and you know things like that just to sort of unlock yourself um and what when that doesn't work it's quite often um put the pen down and go for a walk or do something else just sort of or watch something or read something because also you need um fuel, fuel. exactly exactly it's an engine it's a fire and you've got to put stuff in I think perhaps that's that's one of the reasons why I haven't been enjoying lockdown so much um, is not being able to get as much fuel in terms of watching live things. Yeah. And it's really important. Other people's brains, other people's stories inform yours. Well, this process of, of writing, um, it's an interesting one to start with because that is so much a part of your new play, The Watsons which you've adapted from an unfinished Jane Austen novel of yeah. the same name. Yeah. And I have to say, I, Laura, I'm so gutted I didn't go and see it because it, what an incredible script. Oh, thank you. I mean, you. We, uh, we get a sense from the trailer that we've just watched that this is mm. not a traditional mm -hmm. Jane Austen adaptation. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to say some spoilers now, so if you don't want to know them, chatterboxes cover your ears. Um, but a character called Laura appears, who claims to be the writer of the show and who has a dialogue with the characters in it. And she's clearly having a tough time with the adaptation. She, she, she says as much. She asks for Jane Austen's email address. Um, and she just seems kind of bound by this kind of fear of failure and mm -hmm. weight of expectation from the other characters in the audience. Uh, it struck me reading it as a really vulnerable thing for the character who's claiming to be the writer of the show to admit. Now, this mm -hmm. character obviously shares your profession and is your namesake. I wondered how much of her experiences was yours. Was it a difficult play to write? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It took me, it took me about 12 years to write this play. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not completely all the time. I was writing other things. Um, but no, and Laura wasn't in it originally okay. when I first started doing it. So it was always going to be an unfinished, it was always built on this unfinished book. And it was always going to be about what do the characters do when their author walks out on them. Okay. Um, and for years and years, I was banging my head against it and couldn't get it right. Um, and eventually sort of had this idea of, of putting this Laura character in and sort of dramatising that difficulty. And for ages, I 
I resisted that as well because I thought what kind of idiot puts themselves in a play um and it's for, for a while I felt really embarrassed about it it felt like a really sort of slightly arrogant thing to do um but I but I got comfortable with it and and in the end it's, it sort of really worked because you've got this first of all this culture clash of a modern person going in in disguise to that world um yeah. with you know with her iphone in her hand and the the characters going what on earth is that um because they've they you know they don't even have an old style phone yet um and um but just sort of being able to get in there and and being able to really yeah right through those difficulties and make them part of it um just just sort of liberated it somehow and so it is it is quite i mean yeah she's she's mostly me i've probably actually tamed it down in terms of the um the actual sort of hand wringing and rolling around on the floor in a piece of wall trying to <laughs> um because um you know it's still got to be fun to watch but um but it is absolutely that that kind of struggle and what it and, and what your relationship with your characters feels like as well um, well the Laura in the play says that she um she writes for theatre because she likes the audience clapping which as anyone who works in theatre will empathize with is probably as truthful as it is kind of silly yeah. um but I, I wondered if that is a sentiment that you share with the character of Laura, I wonder whether you were ever ever tempted to kind of get super meta theatrical and play the role of Lyra, uh, Laura, the writer yourself. No, no, <laughs> that would have been, been awful. No, so, I mean, in some parallel universe, there's a sort of fundraising gala somewhere where that happens, and it's awful. Mm -hmm. Um. <laughs> I, I, I can only imagine that that is the that is the circumstance in which I would be persuaded into it. But no, I mean, I had I don't have I don't have actor training and um, I, I would just find it so immensely stressful. So it was actually really it was lovely to um, to cast someone to play essentially me. Um, and then, you, you, you know, you get a slightly um, better version, really, when you when you get an actor doing it and you can you can tweak it and, you know, get them to be funnier and all of that stuff well on first reading it felt to me like a play of um of personal reflection rather mm. than attempting to kind of reflect the world we're living in as mm. how i think of much of your previous work mm. um but reading it a second time i was really struck by the um the discussion of democracy in it mm. it's the, the characters there's a moment where the characters vote for what they want to happen yes and it is a dead 50-50 split with one half of the room wanting to break from the distant governmental force, the writer, mm -hmm. and the other half wanting to remain in, in that arrangement. <laughs> um, I, I, I wondered how important politics is to you whilst you're writing. Is it something that you're kind of consciously trying to um, express or uh, explore? I think so, yeah. it's. I suppose it goes right back to if the place it has to feel like it matters in order to be worth my time writing something and also the audience's time watching something so i think you know and i think one of the the most important things that the theater does is ask questions and i'm much more interested in writing things that ask questions rather than are me standing in a box saying this is what i think about this and this is what you all need to do um so it's, it's kind of getting in there and the way that the way that being in a theatre with an audience can be like a kind of forum or an agora that you know we're all in there to debate something together or ask questions together um and so it so it comes out of that really so although i've never really written anything specifically about politics itself i used to go around saying i wasn't a political playwright um but i think that was because i didn't really understand what it meant um because I think, you know, the act of, especially now in the circumstances we're in now these days, you know, not just COVID, but post Brexit, the act of putting something on is a political thing. Um, and getting those people into a room is a political thing. So, so yeah. Because I would, I would think of you as a, as a sort of political mm. writer, even, you know, Home I'm Darling, which yeah. maybe wasn't on the surface about politics, you know, did, I mean, it's sort of about Brexit, the kind of nostalgia around yeah. 
times gone by that was Absolutely. kind of weaponized in that debate. Yeah. Um, and posh as well, you know, was kind of a, a much more overtly um, yeah. political. Yeah. And for anyone who's not seen posh, so I'd love to talk about it, is um, it, it's a play about a fictional dining society at Oxford University called mm -hmm. Riot Club, mm -hmm. who routinely get drunk and smash up the restaurant that they're dining in. Um, but it's based on a very real secretive dining society at Oxford University called the Bullingdon Club. Previous members include two of our prime ministers, Boris Johnson and Cameron. Um, it, it's a it's a play that shines a light on privilege. Mm. And I, I, I've always wanted to watch this. It opened at the Royal Court, which is famous for new writing, but is also in the heart of Sloane Square, which is yes. one of the most privileged postcodes yes. in London. Yes. What was that experience like of being a writer sat in an audience amongst the people you were challenging? You know, did they recognise that you were pointing a finger at them? Yeah, they did. I mean, uh, the, a lot of them found it extremely funny. I remember standing outside with the director at the end of the, in the, in the interval on the first preview, going, what, what have we done? Because everybody was guffawing the whole time and finding it all immensely funny. Um, and, um, you know, we, we weren't sure that we'd got the tone right, really. Mm. Um, although actually then when they go back in for the second half, um, it all goes horribly wrong. But, um, you know, the, the, the interval point is the character standing on the table saying, I'm sick to death of poor people. Mm. Um, at, at which everybody sort of goes, oh yeah, very good, very good, and goes <laughs> off and gets a gin and tonic. Um, you know, it's very deliberately provocative, but it came, it absolutely came out of the Sloane Square setting, because we started off, the, Lindsay Turner, the director, and I started off working on this idea of um, what did it mean that that theatre was there and the young kids who actually lived there, who would sit on the steps at the front in the evening, waiting to meet their friends, but not actually venturing through the door. And, you know, could we write something that included those kind of people as characters? Um, and also that was a bit more challenging of, of that class because it hadn't been really looked at in, in drama very much recently. So that's, yeah. And, and the members of that, in the play, the members of that mm. society get up to some kind of pretty grotesque things. Mm. Am I right in thinking that you spoke to members of the club and they said it's not grotesque enough? I heard, I heard various things, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult to cut through all the swagger, you know, around that, that kind of stuff. I mean, there are things that I heard about that were too, that were too gruesome to put in, really. Right, as well. Um, and, um, yeah, so it was, you know, researching it was, was, was strange, really, because it was about finding people who were able to talk in, in the right kind of way about it. Um, and, and quite often the most useful people actually were people who had been in some way kind of attached to the group rather than actually in it. Um, so yeah, and it was always going to be, it was always going to be a fictional club. Um, and people have an idea about that play that it's, you know, which one's the Boris Johnson character, which one's the David Cameron character. Um, and actually none of them are specifically supposed to be um, literally any of those people. Um, but, you know, we, we built them as, as young men at that, at, in 2010, originally and then 2012, um, uh, and, and created a club from scratch. But it was quite interesting how many things that we thought we'd made up turned out to be. be true. How interesting. Yeah. I, I think, it, am I right in saying it was the result of a, a quite a long research and development period with Lindsay Turner? Yeah, it was. Yeah, we worked on it from the very beginning. It was wonderful, actually. It was the first time I'd worked that closely with the director from the start of something, because the typical model with a play, for people who don't know, is that you sit in your room and you write it by yourself. And then you, the theatre decide to do it and they fix you up with the director. Mm. And at which point you you have to sort of in a sort of speed dating kind of a way you have to get to know each other really quickly and 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 try and sort of get the director inside your brain to understand where everything in the play has come from. Mm. Whereas if you're working with someone from the very beginning, that they know all of that, um, 
and Lindsay and I would would sit and talk about the characters and you know we both of us knowing you know we both knew what people's mums were called and and what what their upbringing was like and where they'd been to school and all this kind of um quite complicated stuff about all of them that meant that in the end that the, both the play and the production ended up feeling really quite rich because of it I think. Definitely I, I, I would agree completely I, I sat down last night and watched The Riot Club the the screen adaptation with my dad who had not seen the play before. Oh, oh, oh. Um, well it, it was, he was <laughs> quite hot with rage afterwards really? at the injustice of privilege yeah. which the, the film captures just as disarmingly as the play did. Um, and you know, he sat on the sofa for about half an hour afterwards thinking about what he could do to stop it. And oh. Yeah, I, I, but I, I wondered, you know, whether that would have been part of your aim as a, as a, on this and on other projects as a writer. Do you, I wonder whether you write to try and affect change in the world. Yeah, I think so. I think so, yeah, absolutely. You, 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 you want things, to, for people to come out with a sense of how things could be different. Mm. Um, and and how they and how they might do that, or just just sort of sharing your sense of injustice about something. Um, it was always the thing that I held on to when we when we first did posh at the royal court, um, and we had those you know genuinely posh audience members coming to see it, who, um, as I say, seemed to be in, enjoying it all. You know rather too much not that you're not supposed to enjoy it because the, it's supposed to be funny but um uh it, there was a sense that it was a kind of water off a duck's back with them and i would always think to hope that um you know at some point maybe tomorrow morning there'd be something a thought yes when they woke up that would have percolated through about how some, you know things not being quite right now look i'd, I'd love to actually jump onto another topic and ask yeah. about the practicalities of being a writer yes because we sort of know what a day looks like for a, a shop assistant or a greengrocer mm. or even an actor in a rehearsal we kind of understand what that is but mm. what does a day look like for a writer do you work at home do you do the same yeah, thing this is, day? this is my writing shed that we're in right now which is at the bottom of the garden Lovely. um you can see half of it, it's tiny, <laughs> tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, there's only room enough for my desk and my chair and there's room for another person to stand, but they couldn't stay for any length of time, which is kind of deliberate. Um, so what does a day look like? Well, for me now, because I have small children now, the day looks like getting some children up and feeding them breakfast and getting everybody off to school or um, activities and things. Mm -hmm. um, and then getting to the to the desk and hopefully getting on with it. Um, I'm very much a morning writer. So before I had children, I used to I used to get up and go straight to it with us like carrying a bowl of cereal to my desk kind of thing. And will in, in both scenarios will have done the bulk of my work before lunch. And the bit after lunch, um, we're, we're back out of it now, thankfully, at, at this time of day. But the bit after lunch is a bit rubbish because I'm sort of slightly falling asleep. <laughs> um, so that's the time I tend to use for bits and bobs of research or if there's something I need to watch or emails and admin -y things. Because there's also admin with any of these things. There's admin you have to do. Um, uh, so that's, that's my writing life. And then it, it tends to be that I'm working on one thing at once, okay. um, doing a draft of a thing, and I need to get it done in however many weeks time. And that can be either a, a first draft of something, which takes quite a long time, some, some months, or a, a quick redraft of something. Um, and um, then there's somebody waiting for me to hand that thing in, and then I hand that thing in, and then I, move on to the next thing so that so in, that's during writing time that's what I'm doing um and, it, and it's your process for writing a play at one of research before you put pencil to paper yeah yes yes research and um it, it sort of I don't know what the word I'm trying, I'm trying to imaginating um some kind of um time spent 
kind of digesting the research as I'm doing it and um, looking for story, really. That's what you're doing in research is you're looking for characters and story. Um, and um, so th those things are sort of going on at the same time as, as a story is emerging. And then there's a big planning stage because I'm a real structural writer. So everything I do gets planned out, planned out, planned out. This um, this wall behind me, it's got, it's got a weird rug on it at the moment because my partner's been using this room as a recording studio and so I had to sort of make the wall softer. But normally that's all covered in post-it notes right about of the thing that i'm writing on about now and i've got pictures i've got pictures up there that are from a, a potential telly series that i'm trying to write at the moment um so I, I sort of have to get it all out of my head either onto the computer or up there um and so that can go on quite a long time and it's it, it can be quite a while until the point where i'm ready to actually write the play or the script at which point it can quite often come out quite quickly. Well, if I've done the planning right, it comes out quite quickly. Okay. Um, because the planning is all intended to make it flow. So if I'm sitting down, I, I like that bit actually, when, I, when I've done my planning, sitting down and I'm sort of pick, sitting down at my desk going, okay, I'm writing scene two today and this is who's in it and this is what needs to happen in it and you know, get, get a draft done. Um, and um, and how, how soon do you, let people read it? Do you show it to people halfway through a draft or do you wait until after you've done a complete draft or even a second? Yeah, it depends. At the moment, I'm tending to try and replicate that um, brilliant um, relationship I had with Lindsay working on Posh the first time, um, which really got me into the idea of having a director on board quite early. So with Home I'm Darling, we did some initial workshops. I mean, the, the director was Tamara Harvey and we did some initial stuff before I wrote anything again. And so with that, I was sending bits and bobs to her as I wrote them because she was already intimately involved with it. Um, if and, and the same with the Watsons, which was my partner Sam was directing it. Um, so that, so I was sending him bits and bobs. So I'm, I'm, if I've got a director or someone involved at that point, I'm not too precious about sending it to them early because otherwise it can feel like quite a hurdle actually to get over. Mm. If it's a whole complete script and nobody apart from you knows about it and you've no idea if it's any good or not, it's a real sort of um, heart sinking moment to first show it to someone, especially if you send it to them and they don't read it for ages. And <laughs> You're thinking, oh, they, they, hated, they hated it. <laughs> they hated it. But yeah, I mean, and there's, there's no, there's no response to that that's quick enough. Mm. Like you're, you're sort of like thinking, how long does it take to read a 90 page script? Okay, well, it's been 90 minutes and they've not rung me, so they obviously hate it. <laughs> like, you, know, you just sent it to them an hour ago, for God's sake. They're having oh. a lunch. <laughs> We haven't spoken at all about your route into the industry yet, but I'm, I'm hoping some young people will have submitted questions to that end. Um, but first, we're, we're going to bring a young person onto screen now to ask a question camera to camera. Um, a rich uh, technical magician is going to magic Lily onto your screen. Uh, now, Lily is a member of Playbox, the youth theatre yeah. who create Chatterbox, um, and she attends their Young Writers course and is a, a budding playwright herself. Yeah. Um, so, Lily, are you there? Is she going to pop up? Oh, no, perhaps not. Okay, well, I'll tell you what we'll do is we'll, if Lily appears at any point, we'll jump into Lily's question. Uh, but for now, what we'll do is we'll head over to our um, Instagram poll that we did earlier today. We launched a poll on uh, the Chatterbox's Takeover, Playbox's mm -hmm. Instagram account. And again, any, everyone could pitch a question and we got them to vote for uh, which question they would like to hear answered by you. And with 62% of the vote, people would like to know, are the characters you write based on people you know? Some of them are in, in bits. So I tend to hide, I tend to hide things in quite a sneaky way um because i find the idea of someone watching something and going oh that's me a bit horrifying um so i tend but i write down things that interest me about people i know 
Um, and there's quite often a sort of, oh, here's Lily. Hi. Hi, Lily. Sorry about Hi. that. Hello, Hello, Lily. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. Sorry about that. I just had a bit of an, an issue, but hi. That's all right. We have to make do in these difficult times, Lily. Um, <laughs> now, what is your question for Laura? Uh, hi, Laura. Uh, my question is, uh, what was the hardest part of adapting your play, Posh, into a film? That is a really good question. Um, I think the, the hardest thing is how different a play and a film are. Um, and Posh, um, for people who don't know it, is basically pretty much one long scene of uh, 10 people having dinner over the course of almost two hours. And films don't really work like that in terms of their rhythm, in terms of the way that you tell a story in a film. So it was trying to find a way to tell that same story, but in a very, very different form. Um, and having to deal with things like in that play format, when we're in a theatre, it's all ideas and debates and discussions and things can go on for quite a long time. Whereas a film is story, 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 story. A film is like a, a long, long list of things that happen. And so trying to get all of those ideas from the play into an exciting and, you know, rip roaring um, narrative was was the thing and that took me quite a long time and I had to have quite a lot of help because I'd not done it before and so my producers were very um were very patient with me in terms of letting me write not very good draft after not very good draft after not very good draft until I just sort of like found my way towards it but yeah that was it that's great does that answer your question Lily yeah definitely you must take that back to your uh, writer's group at Playbox. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks so much, Lily. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. So uh, let's take it across to the Q&A inbox. And there are loads of questions in here, Laura. Ooh. So, so many. Um, right at the top, mm. with loads of votes, um, is from Amelie. She says, what is your process like when first approaching writing a new play? So we talked a bit about that, haven't we? About so, um, so yeah. It, Do they, does it come from an idea of yours, or are you off, are you provoked by a commissioner? Say, I'm usually um, it, it's usually something that I've had knocking around in the back of my head for a while that I will have picked up usually off um, a, a news story or an article I've read or something someone's talked about, or, you know, I mean, the, the cliche is things you hear about on the bus, but I don't go on the bus that much because my office is at the bottom of my garden. Um, but, um, and it, it'll sort of noodle away in, in the back. And yeah, these days, because I'm most often writing a commission for a theatre, I might, um, I might say, I've got this idea. Does that sound about like the sort of thing that you're looking for? Um, and, you know, if they say yes, then I might, you know, write it for them. Um, and, and then it goes off in, and once it becomes official, then I'm like, well, I probably should write it then. And then it gets into that researchy, planny place. Great. That you're talking about. Yeah. Fantastic. But Martha asks, um, how did you initially break into the writing business? How do you go about approaching companies with plays? That's, yes. Well, I started quite young. Uh, and I, I think one of the important things that I did quite early on was, was write a full length play. Um, and if you're someone who thinks you would like to be a playwright, I would encourage that, I think, is have a go, because it's a big hurdle to get over. It's a, a, a full length play is a, is a big thing. It's a, it's a big feat of imagination and um, it's a lot of words and you, you kind of need to know that you can, you can do that, that you can structure something, that you can, you, you can make it and that you enjoy making it. Um, because some of the time, you know, writing, writing isn't easy and it's solitary and it can be difficult to motivate yourself or to get your brain in gear and to, to, to really kind of 
problem solve all the time. So knowing that you really, really, really want to do it is, is a really important first step. The way I got into it um, initially was sending scripts to theatres. Um, I think it was a slightly different situation when I was doing it first because it was, this was sort of the early 2000s and theatre at that time had had a, a lot of money um, bumped into it and a lot of theatres were looking for new plays and they were actively um, reporting back. If you sent them something they would send you a, a, a letter with a, a, a reader's report. Um, which fewer of the theatres can afford to do now, sadly. But that's that's as simple as it was. It was it was sending things in and, and trying to get into writers' programmes like the Royal Court Young Writers or you know the Playbox Writers Group would be a really important first step if if that was something that you were anywhere near or you know each you know if other youth theatres have a, a writers group in the area. Um, that's that's an important thing. Wonderful advice. Um, David asks, if there was one play you wish you had written, what would it be? Enron. Enron. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. My partner was in it, so I saw it a lot of times. Um, and yeah, I just thought that was completely brilliant. I was I was in awe of it. I know Lucy, and I sometimes, you know, I sort of fangirl at her about it but I just thought it was just because it was so amazingly um theatrical and it took it she was able to talk about high finance in a way that made it make sense mm. um and it was utterly gripping um and uh yeah I just thought it was and it had dinosaurs in it it was great <laughs> what would you need what? Um, Elliot asks, what do you find is the biggest difference between writing for stage and writing for screen? Uh, um, I think it's the, the, the rhythm and the grammar of, of, of the, fo the form of it. Um, it's a really useful exercise, actually, if you're interested in writing, to get hold of some screenplays. There's lots of screenplays on the internet. Um, and just compare the way that a, a story is told in a screenplay and the way that a story is told in a play are very different. And what I was saying before about, about with the Riot Club, it's about events, it's about things happening. And it's a, a film munches a lot of story. You have to cultivate the ability to, to be quite easily bored when you're writing, trying to get onto the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Um, whereas a play has a much kind of looser structure somehow and you can you can all sort of sit and take a bath in an idea together. Um, uh, but also, you know, plays, people people pretty much stay in the room. So, you, so you've got them, that you've got them there, you know, you've got them there. So whereas with a, with a film, um, you know, they could just, they could just walk out, particularly by the time it's on the telly. So you've got to keep, keep it interesting. Well, that's, that sort of links into a question here from Harish, who says, for an aspiring writer, do you think it's better to start writing for stage or writing for screen? Mm. I would say go with the thing you love doing. Um, I, th I think it's possibly simpler to get a play on, although actually that's not true anymore. I'm, I'm, you see, I'm talking about what things were like at the beginning of my career, but now we live in a world where you can make a film on your phone. Mm. So, and, and, you know, award-winning films have been made on someone's phone. So there isn't that kind of barrier of breaking into a thing. So I think to choose the form you really love. Sometimes, you know, you find, young writers sort of struggling along in the theatre when actually they really would prefer to be writing for film. And it's, that you might as well just go on and do the thing that you really, you really want to do. If that, if that form if it suits your writing better and if you really love that more, you know, which, which is the thing that you want to do all of the time mm. in terms of, you know, I, I wanted to learn um, by going to the theatre every night in my 20s. 
almost every night. Um, and so that, you know, that's what I did. I missed lots of really great films, but, um, you, you know, so, you know, what's the, what's the thing that you really love? Because I think actually both things are, are equally easy or difficult. Great. Follow that thread of passion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Scarlett asks, and this actually links into a question from uh, Barney as well. So I'm going to try and combine two questions here. Um, Scarlett asks, in regard to Posh, mm. she says, what aspect do you think is important to emphasise for an all-female cast? And Barney sort of adds to that, saying um, uh, he felt that the uh, maleness was sort of intrinsic to how we judge them and their behaviour. And he asked if there was a difference in watching the all-female cast, which mm. I think there was a, an all-female version. Of was, yeah. It was, yeah, there was. I think the thing, and I'm, I'm all for people doing gender-switched versions of it or whatever, because I've, I've lived with the guilt of having written that many good parts for boys um, <laughs> when there are so many wonderful young uh, female actresses around. Um, and I think at that point I sort of swore that I wouldn't ever again write a, a play that was so sort of strongly male skewed. Um, but the thing about that play is that it's much more about class than about gender. Mm. And so to succeed at playing those boys, it's much more about succeeding at playing a posh, entitled, privileged person than it is about effectively playing a man, if that makes sense. People who play, the, the actors I've seen who play those characters the best are the ones that, who, who can get the the ease with which those boys are able to move through the world so that you don't it's really important as an actor attacking those characters that you don't ever treat them as a caricature that you don't ever send them up because the script sends them up you just have to sort of go go into it through the character and live their world and understand that you know they think they've got problems so you have to you have to in, inhabit that person um, and but just that you know the way that they walk into a room like they own it you have to be able to to do that and if you can do that it, that's much more important than you know rolling up a sock and sticking it down the front of your trousers kind of thing <laughs> very good excellent um ruby asks uh what is the most difficult part of the production process apart from the writing uh, the most difficult part, I think previews can be quite difficult because um, there, you, say you only have a few previews to get it right and if there are problems with the play, you're trying to, to change things in a much quicker way than you have ever during the process before mm. um so uh if you if you you know something wrong with scene three and you've got to try and rewrite it you know preview one is on monday night and you're doing preview two on a tuesday night and you're trying to write something overnight and then rehearse it the next morning and get it into the show so you can see if it works and it's quite easy to get into sort of panic mode at that point and um and the work that you do have to be really careful to make sure that it's as deep as the work that you did two years ago when you were writing the play at your leisure yeah. and there wasn't an audience turning up to watch it at 7 30 that night so it's it can be a real exercise in holding your nerve um, and trying not to fiddle with things that don't need fiddling with or knowing knowing when something's not working and some you can't know until you get things up in front of an audience. But that all happens very quickly. So you rehearse for four weeks and then suddenly you've got a week of previews and then the press are coming in to review it. Um, and yeah, so that that I find quite hard. Sounds like quite an intense little period yeah, of time. Yeah, yeah, it can be. And and for the first time, it's very much the cast are over there behind the curtain and you're in that you're there in the audience. And that's quite that can be quite um exposing as well 
particularly if they know who you are, but even if they don't know who you are, I, I've, there, there have been times when I've been sort of stood in the loo queue at the interval, trying not to listen to people saying they don't like it. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> Um, you might think being a bat because you're just in and out, aren't you? You don't have to queue. But, in, you know, for the ladies, you have to stand there for quite a long time listening to people who don't know who you are talking about how much they don't like or do like your play. Do you ever start conversations about it and sort of provoke? <laughs> um, well, I, times I have done that, I've always fallen absolutely flat on my face. Right. <laughs> I've either ended up sort of outing myself and then massively, like... Um, embarrassing the person or just sort of like weirdly pretending that I'm a costume assistant and then just just sort of like <laughs> to run away before the questions get too difficult um so no I tend to sort of I keep my headlights really dipped and try and get out as quickly as possible <laughs> well speaking of difficult questions here's one from Martha who says Ooh. given the uh, given the current climate do you think writers should begin to write with social distancing in mind or at least with an idea of what the future of theatre could be? That's a really interesting question, Martha. And I haven't solved it in terms of my own writing. Um, it's really difficult to know how, isn't it, how long we're, this situation is going to go on for. I suppose, yeah, if you're being pragmatic, um, you know, the... Um, the show that the old Vic are doing at the moment, Lungs, mm. that they're performing in um, in a socially distanced kind of a way with no audience, um, was written as a play for two voices with no stage, no set. Um, and it works brilliantly. But you have to be quite careful that that your idea fits if you were trying to do something like that that your story idea fits with that kind of form um so i it might be good to have something up your sleeve um, my hope is that sooner rather than later we get if we all hold our nerves long enough we get to go back to watching plays properly um as, as in, you know, some sitting because because I think that's one of the very particular things about it is being in that room all together, um, and being part of an a, an audience, a large audience, um, and and actors being able to touch each other. Um, but nevertheless, if you have an idea that would fit the other kind of writing, then it's not like nobody's going to put it on. We just have to hope things. It's really good you know change yeah. don't they yeah. soon yeah um, this is a question from um erin who says it's a really great question i'd love to know the answer to this any tips for when you have a few ideas for writing but aren't sure how to get them uh expand them from a post-it note into a proper story mm. that is a good question because quite often things sound really good on a post-it note, don't they? And then it yeah. turns out that you haven't got enough. I mean, I find those those ideas can take me quite a long time to... Um, I'll, I'll tend to start a new file or a new notebook for each idea and add to it when something comes to me. And that's usually some time before I come to be actually writing it, that I'm writing something else. But if something's nibbling away at my ear... Um, and I'm having ideas about it, then um, then it's sort of at some point it builds up, and then you kind of know, sort of know when it's you can sort of smell when it's when it's matured enough. Um, and it's probably you know it's probably like I don't know being a chef with all all of my analogies are food related, but um, <laughs> a chef with a you know pots on several different you know several different sauces on the go. And knowing when it's thick enough to use and knowing when it needs a bit more boiling. And, and you can have several on the go and, and, and choose the one that, that, that bubbles up. That's, that's great. That's great advice. Now, look, we've only got about five minutes to go. Should we see yeah. if we can do a kind of quick fire, yes. rest through as many as we can? Um, Isabella says, what's the best advice you've received about the industry? Be less sensitive. Nice. Harry says, have you been worried when you sent off one of your plays? Yes, always. 
um, people might not like it. But I get I get better as I get older at going, well, if they don't like it, then someone else will. Or if they don't like it, then that, that's not my, you know, theatre or whatever. Great. Um, this is not a short one to answer, but I'm going to ask. Um, how, di how different is it to write an adaptation as opposed to an original play? It's a different side of your brain somehow. An adaptation, you're talking about how, how to tell the story, whereas with an original play, it's what's the story. So that's essentially what it is. So I quite like to sort of alternate between the two because each one feels like a break from the other. Great. Um, Amelia, is it ever strange watching a play that you've written? Uh, yeah, it can be. It's, it's super strange watching it when you've had... Um, I've sometimes had the experience of going to watch something um, that I've had nothing to do with the production. So, or, or, or in a different country, in a different language. And you just sort of like rock up and watch it. And, and that's really weird because it's all they've had is what's on the page and no input from you. Yeah. And that's fascinating to know, you know, if, you've, if you're not sitting in the corner of the rehearsal or going, oh, I didn't mean to say it like that, um, then, you know, what, what do they actually come up with? Or what do they add in that you didn't put in there in the first place? So that can be really strange and distancing. I, I bet it's really fun. Um, Harry asks, um, do you have a good relationship with your publishers? Yes, I do. Um, uh, I, I like my publishers very much. Um, I've had the same publisher the whole time. There are very few publishers that um, publish play scripts. Um, I think it's a different relationship from... Uh, and a novel and a novelist and their publisher, because obviously then the editor is sort of helping yes. decide what to, whereas if you're doing a play, the director and the company are, are sort of helping you with the, that editing function. Um, so, but, um, but yeah, it's quite- ask, With your publisher, are you, um, are you quite precise about how it should be appear on the page? Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm a pain. <laughs> I am a um, I am a, a massive punctuation pedant um, because you want it to look you want it to look right you want it to to read right. Um, so um, so yeah, there've been there've been various times when I've been published, but in uh, other countries where I've found the the text sort of gets squished up and looks you know different, and it doesn't. It doesn't read as fluidly as I would like it to, and that, that makes me upset. Um, Emily Pepper asks, what's the favourite thing you've written? A difficult question. Oh, that's like asking me which of my children I like best. <laughs> I can't. Um, probably, you the, pass, probably, if you the like. Watsons, probably the Watsons, because it took so long to write and it was so painful along the way and then turned out really nice in the end. Lovely. Well, the last question it. is going to be from me this week and okay. only because it links to the Watsons there. On the penultimate page of the Watson script, the character, Laura the writer, says to the protagonist, don't ever feel embarrassed to call yourself an artist. Why shouldn't we feel embarrassed to do that? I think the le the next line isn't it something like plenty of worse people have and and not worried about it. Yes, yeah, Some, yeah, something like that. I think it was it was in particularly that was particularly me talking to all the young women in the audience about just owning your voice and believing yourself to be worthwhile as a storyteller and as a voice. On, on stage and that you've got something to say to people and not to feel um, embarrassed or apologetic about that um, because it's because your voice is really important and you know, pe people should hear it um, and that yeah, we can we can be very sort of um, funny about admitting that what that what we do is art and um, yeah, I think it's just about kind of owning it and, like I say, taking up some space. I think that is a lovely note to end on. 
Um, that just about concludes episode four of Chatterbox. But before we wrap up, Laura, I wondered if you'd be kind enough to share your lockdown list with us, a few things to keep us stimulated in isolation. Yeah. So, well, it's one, it's one main thing, really. Great. Which is that um, my children, who are six and two and a half, have been obsessively listening to the soundtrack for the show Matilda ah. um, recently. And through through listening to that with them, and they haven't seen it, and I'm absolutely praying it comes back because the eldest one really wants is desperate to see it now. Um, but through listening to that over and over and over again with them, just enjoying so much how smart the lyrics are. Yeah. And it reminded me of when I was a kid and uh, we had a few records of things like Phantom of the Opera. Um, or Joseph and his amazing Technical the Dreamcoat, and we had printed out lyrics that came with the, the record, like <laughs> the people listening to this book, <laughs> even a record. Um, but um, this is, you know, a long time pre-Spotify, but I used to sit and, and read them, and so many amazing idioms and words that I hadn't met before, um, I, I came across for the first time in those lyrics. And... Um, it just made me think that 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 would be a really worthwhile thing to get interested in in song lyrics find because you can find everything obviously now on the internet you can you, you can find the lyrics to, to 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 anything you like just notice how how clever particularly if you're interested in writing how cleverly the the lyricist has has told you the story or what the character is feeling or doing um or you know something like Hamilton as well incredibly yeah. smart lyrics um so that that was my yeah little that's great thank, thank you so much for, for sharing that um now that is all we've got time for today but join me same time next week when I'll be talking to the shadow culture secretary herself a former actor and writer who became MP for Batley and Spen in 2016 after the murder of her friend MP Joe Cox it is of course the remarkable Tracy Brabin now, in the spirit of keeping the creative conversation going week to week, I think you've got a question for Tracy. Is that right? I have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask her <laughs> if she had two minutes alone with the prime minister right now, what would she say to him about saving our industry? That is a great jumping off point for next week big but there we go <laughs> well tune in to see how tracy answers that one um if you've enjoyed today's episode and you want to catch up on any of our previous episodes you can head over to youtube.com forward slash playbox theater where you'll find interviews with star of downton abbey phyllis logan multi-award winning hamlet and star of i may destroy you pa papa Esiedu, or even the start of 1917 george Mackay. and don't forget we'd love to hear what you think so please send us your thoughts reactions and feedback to at playbox theater hashtag chatterbox on whatever social media channels you like to use um, and before we wrap up, just a quick reminder that Playbox Theatre, the youth theatre who produced Chatterbox, are in the middle of a £50,000 fundraising appeal that is absolutely critical to their survival. So if you've enjoyed this episode and want to support the company who make it, please head over to justgiving.com forward slash playbox dash theatre. All that leaves me to do is to say a final thank you to Laura Wade for joining us today. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for having me. And thank you to all the Chatterbox partners up and down the country. We couldn't do it without you. And thank you to all of you at home for watching. Till next Friday, stay creative and see you soon. Goodbye. <laughs>